The central highlands of Tasmania, no stranger to bitterly cold weather where the mountains and valleys can be covered in winter snow metres deep. Now imagine, if you can, this landscape covered in an ice cap six kilometres high. That's what happened here in three ice ages that began two million years ago, the latest finishing a mere 10,000 years ago. As the all-powerful glaciers retreated, they eroded and carved away the landscape, leaving mountain peaks, deep river gorges, wild alpine moorlands and glacial lakes. In their wake, they created a wilderness area, so special it has been recognised by the United Nations for World Heritage Listing. The Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area covers 1.6 million hectares, almost a quarter of the island state. It qualifies in not just one, but seven of the ten criteria for natural and or cultural values, which according to the United Nations transcend national boundaries and is of importance for present and future generations of all humanity. One of only two places on earth to do so. As the glaciers retreated, they carved out the landscape and created a unique alpine environment with connections going back to Gondwana, the supercontinent that began to split apart 170 million years ago. Named by an early surveyor for its resemblance to a gold miner's cradle, Cradle Mountain is composed of igneous dolerite an extremely hard rock formed by molten rock pushed up through the Earth's crust, a formation that extends 4,000 kilometres from the mainland to the Antarctic. It's so hard and devoid of any mineral value, except as road base, that it was described in a government report in 1937 as Tasmania's curse. But that curse is now the base for Tasmania's treasure, in a land of breathtaking geological contrasts. Its diverse vegetation ranges from rainforest to buttongrass moorlands, conifers such as myrtle beech, deciduous beech, kingbilly pine, pencil pine and celery top pine. Its lakes and streams contain species which have links going back even further, more than 200 million years ago. Tasmania's separation and isolation provided a refuge for animals now extinct or on the verge of extinction on the mainland. Not so much the common wombat which can be seen nibbling on the grasses or waddling unperturbed by camera-toting tourists. More difficult to see in the wild are the iconic Tasmanian devil, believed to have become extinct on the mainland some 3,000 years ago or the eastern quoll, which hasn't been seen on the mainland in more than 60 years. There has been human habitation in this area for at least 35,000 years. During the latest glacial period, when Tasmania was still connected to the Australian continent, indigenous tribes crossed the land bridge across the Bass Strait, becoming the most southerly inhabitants on Earth. When the glaciers retreated and sea levels rose, they became isolated from the mainland, establishing their own rich culture. What you see around the lakes today is evidence of recent European occupation. But off this well-beaten trail, archaeologists have identified hundreds of sites of the Big River and Northern Tasmanian First Nation people, proof of their continuous habitation. They moved through the valleys hunting game and gathering plants during the warmer months. While the indigenous Tasmanians lived in, used and managed these mountains, lakes and forests for at least 35,000 years, it took less than a decade for their lives to be destroyed. The first record of a European in the Cradle Valley was in 1827. A year later, martial law was introduced throughout the colony, approving and rewarding the capture of any Aborigines at large. By the mid-30s, the tribe virtually disappeared from the area. 
The natural and cultural values of the Cradle Mountain area was also threatened by explorers, prospectors, hunters, trappers, timber getters and graziers, with plans for large mines, railways, farms and plantations. Ironically, it was the rugged nature of the environment which limited development, because it was too expensive and difficult to build rail and road access to the west coast ports. What turned the fate of Cradle Valley was the arrival of two botanists, Austrian-born Gustav Weindorfer and his wife Kate. Their passion and vision led to Cradle Mountain being declared a national park. In 1910, they climbed to the summit of Cradle Mountain, where, legend has it, he declared, this must be a national park for the people for all time. The Weindorfers bought land and built a home and chalet for guests. In 1922, after a vigorous campaign, the government gazetted the area from Dove Lake to Lake St. Clair, an area of almost 64,000 hectares, as a scenic reserve. It was declared a wildlife reserve in 1927, a national park in 1947 and World Heritage Area in 1982. Although hunters, trappers, loggers and graziers operated in the area well into the 20th century, at times they were limited only by market forces for their timber and skins. Ironically, it was a fur trapper, Bert Nichols, who in 1931 was responsible for blazing what is now one of the world's great alpine hiking trails, the iconic 65-kilometre overland track from Cradle Mountain to Lake St. Clair. It now attracts some 9,000 hikers a year, while Cradle Mountain's Dove Lake and Crater Lake attract upwards of 280,000 tourists and hikers a year, as many as 3,000 a day in peak times. Clearly it achieves the ambitions of the United Nations and Gustav Weindorfer's hope that it be a national park for the people to enjoy for all time. It is truly a place of exceptional natural beauty.